A closed path starts and ends at the same point. Here's one in an equation, and another, and another. But closed areas are not in this video. We are sticking to the path. And most of the mathematical details are left for part two, along with a special result. Here is our function. It's a handsome function. Let us integrate it from one to four. So far, so good. But you said that a closed integral starts and stops at the same point. Well, and, and if you just swap the limits, everything cancels, so it's no big deal. But what if we could jump off the axis and integrate along this path? That would be a big deal. It would allow us to go outside and lift up an apple, giving it potential energy equal to mgh. And it doesn't matter which of these two paths you choose. Any path from start to finish, same delta h, same change in energy. And therefore, any path that starts and ends at the same place, zero delta e. No net work done by gravity, because gravity is a conservative force. But you protest all this lifting and lowering of apples. It's work. It's tiring me out. Yes, but we're not talking about you and your muscles. Gravity does not get tired. A different example. Pushing a car. Here the path does matter. The blue path is longer, more friction. And a closed loop here would be no big deal. Friction still does lots of work. Friction is not conservative. This electric field is. A closed path here means no change in electric potential energy. How about a spring? Compress, expand, and as long as you end up at the same point you started at, the same spring energy. Even in space, it's the same story. Two paths to the same point, that would be the same change in potential energy. Now these paths are different. Float along an orbit or rocket in red, and you might be burning different amounts of fuel. You might be going different speeds when you get to the end. But from start to end, it's the same change in potential energy. That's all I'm saying. Well, that, and for a closed path, this, and therefore that. So, okay, I guess I am saying a lot about the network done by gravity or by the electric field. Friction, again, is different. Friction, again, is not conservative. But there is something I notice about this path. Counterclockwise or reverse it, either way, the work even if it's not zero, the work would be the same clockwise or counterclockwise. Is that always true? Well, no, not if there's a tornado. This time, work done by the tornado would be positive. Reverse direction, and you are fighting against the wind. I blame the dot product. Back to the apple. Gravity is straight down, meaning only motion in the y direction matters. Throw the apple upwards. Gravity does negative work on it, and it slows down. When the apple falls, gravity does positive work, and the apple speeds up. Our focus, though, is on potential energy, which depends on height. Switching to electric fields, energy still depends on the y coordinate. For the spring, however, it's the x-coordinate that matters. And here, the field is no longer constant. It gets stronger to the right. Gravitational orbits seem complex, but energy still depends only on one dimension. This time, it's the radial distance to the planet. That's all that matters. That's why a closed path still has zero net work. And if it's true for a single inverse square field, it's still true when we add multiple ones of those together but not here. Up and to the right, sometimes it's positive, but not always. Anti-clockwise, I guess you could say here it's always positive for this field, but the field is stronger out here and weaker in the center. For more crazier fields, again, see part two and for the mathematical details, but back to the whirlpool and this path. Hey, zero work done for this path. That's what happens when your path is perpendicular to the field at every point. Again, we're blaming the dot product. So how can you calculate this for that curve? Zooming in and taking a little piece of the curve and the dot product with the field again and again and again and again. That's part two. Here, we're going back to the car. 
If we say it feels a force of six newtons, that's the friction force anywhere it moves, then the work done on the car would be force times distance. So let us calculate the length, the path integral ds, of the red and blue paths here, expressed with dx and dy, and then rearrange it. So far, so good. But what defines that red curve again? Oh yeah, this does, and there's its derivative. And I'm not ashamed to ask for help evaluating this integral. There is the length. The blue curve is different. It's an ellipse with this equation and those details. Our first job is to move the xy axis so it's centered, but don't worry, that's not going to affect the path length. So switch to radial coordinates. We want ds, and there it is. A bit of rearranging and another integral. What are the limits? This is complicated, it's not really our point, but there's the upper limit, that's a right angle, there's the lower limit, and you can check to see if these results are reasonable. I think they're pretty good. The path length, wait a minute, it's more than that. It's a closed integral, and if you multiply by six, it's the work done by friction. To find again the work for a more complex field and the special result, I will see you in part two.